Set in 18 acres of ground, this pretty house in Bembridge, Isle of Wight, is up for sale. But what is a house? Much more than the house. When it's Steen Wood Battery, a house with its own Victorian fort in the back garden. The house as we see it today was built on the parade area of a Victorian fort with extensive earthworks and gun emplacements. Historic England say this is one of the best preserved Victorian batteries known. Complete with little details like this derrick for lifting shells that just aren't present anywhere else. The current owners have allowed me to have a look around and I can't wait to uncover its history. The first question though is what's here and why? The tree line shows where we are. When the fort was built from 1889 to 1894, this area was Bear Hillside, the highest point in Bembridge. And if we go from one of the six gun emplacements that are here and head high into the sky, we can see that we're on the coastline of the Isle of Wight. An important bit of coast too, the Solent and approaches to Portsmouth Harbour. Steenwood Battery was built as a stopgap measure to help defend the Solent and join a line of other defences built in the 1860s and 70s, like near neighbour Bembridge Fort. But even as it was being finished, it was obsolete, and the guns never came. Had the guns ever been placed here, they'd have formed what's known as a high-angle battery. What does that mean? Well, quite simply, the gun will be pointing at this sort of angle, high up into the air rather than the normal lower trajectory firing like that. The reason was one of technology. The French ships had really hard metal hulls. They simply couldn't punch through them as they would have done. So they went high with the idea of coming down low through the wooden deck. It would have meant the gun operators would have been reliant on Bembridge Fort guiding their firing as they wouldn't have been able to see the target up to a potential 10,000 yards away. And although the guns were never fitted, everything else to make a weapon of the year of fire effectively is here to see. This is the cartridge and shell store, one of two actually on site, and this wonderfully preserved sign tells us about it. It's for the 9-inch, 12-tonne, rifled muzzle-loading guns, specifically guns four, five, and six in this instance. Here's how the process would have worked. Shell brought in, block and tackle here, lifted up, and then lowered back down into this wooden mounting hole. That's the first part of the process. Then, through into this next room, let's get my torch out. For the first part of assembly, the tubes will be assembled on it. There's sorts of device to make it explode, either percussion, when it hits something, or on a timer, and the fuses, you'll note, spelt with a Z there. Once fitted, shell brought through on a bogey, wheeled down this corridor by staff members. And I just want to take a moment or two to pause here and look at this wonderful brickwork, covered in its original lime wash. If you look closely, the, the mortar is raised. That's all the same, all over this entire structure, all over this entire complex. The reason is the builders thought if it was recessed like it is on your normal house, over time gunpowder could collect and cause an explosion. Yes, it was all about firepower, but it was about safety first. And if you worked here, that would be your primary concern. You'd come in to start your shift, you'd take off your outer normal day clothes, removing all metal and put on special outfits with drawstrings, and then come through this barrier, lower it for the most dangerous part of the day's work, which involved these lead-lined containers, which would have been full of gunpowder, which would have been added to the shells in this room, before they themselves are manhandled out through this hatch and off to the gun. One gun in that direction, a further two up here, pushed all the way on little railway carriages, if you like, and eventually they'd have gone outside through this hatch. There would have been, had this place ever been operational, some form of mechanism here to lift them up and propel them out, but that was never fitted. Instead, it's got a stone wall at the end of their journey now. And here's the other side of it. You can just imagine the armed shells coming out. And some of the emplacements have the remains of the rails that would have been used to transport the huge shells that weighed up to 250 pounds. The battery was decommissioned in 1898 and bought in 1909 by Sir John Thornycroft. And he had this large building put up. Built in 1910, it looks like the world's 
biggest indoor swimming pool, but is in fact another wonderful piece of military history. It's a testing tank. More specifically, it was used to see how well the hulls of ships would go through the water. Models will be pulled back and forth across the tank and all sorts of calculations taken. Sir John Thornycroft, you see, owned the Thornycroft shipbuilders in Wollstone, and the tank here helped fine-tune many hulls for the military. This is a model of a motorboat from the First World War, which was actually put into service. You can see on the rear, they've cut a notch in the hull. The water goes over here, the designers then discovered it goes bubbly through the notch, which enables it to go more quickly over the rear of the craft, making the whole thing more streamlined and faster. Without this tank, they wouldn't have found that out. This is without a doubt a unique property, quite literally enveloped in military history. There can be nothing else like it anywhere. Tim Cooper, Forces News, Bembridge. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe.